Uh, welcome, everyone, to a occasional lecture supported by the Consortium for Understanding and Sustaining a Biodiverse Planet. It's good to see people here from quite a number of units that are interested in biodiversity and also the preservation of biodiversity long term. My name is John Kress. I direct this particular consortium. Uh, we will occasionally have these lectures and we'll probably move them around the institution depending upon uh, the uh, uh, topic. But it's a way to get, again, our scholars from different, actually from different units within the Smithsonian, but also from outside institutions together to talk about issues uh, regarding the, the three major themes of biodiversity, whether it's sustainability, uh, genomics, or our global Earth observatories, uh, to address those topics. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Pierre Camazzoli, reproductive physiologist at the Conservation Biology Institute, who will introduce our speaker today. Before I introduce Pierre, I just would like to say welcome to Dr. Emmett Duffy, who's sitting here. Many of you know he was uh, selected, and he's just started his position, position as director of the Tenenbaum Marine Observatories Network. So it's great to have you here, Emmett. Pierre. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon to the people uh, on the web. Um, yeah, my name is Pierre Kamitsoli, and I'm here with uh, a double hat. I am a research biologist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, but uh, I'm also leading a project at the Smithsonian called uh, Pan-Smithsonian Cryo Initiative, and it's part of really uh, of the effort of understanding and sustaining uh, a biodiverse planet. And as you know, at the Smithsonian, we have collections of uh, biomaterials, and some of those biomaterials are in a frozen state. So today, uh, this afternoon, we have a really prestigious um, speaker to talk about that. And uh, I'm talking about Dr. Brown, who is uh, currently a, a non-resident uh, fellow at the Brookings Institution here in Washington, DC. He was uh, also, before that, the science advisor uh, to the Secretary of Interior, uh, Bruce Babbitt. And he was also uh, the president and CEO at the Bishop Museum in Hawaii, the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, and the Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts. He has chaired uh, the boards of the Ocean Conservancy and the Global Heritage Fund. And Dr. Brown, uh, is coming from an interesting background. He has um, a Bachelor uh, of Science in Biology from the University of Virginia. And uh, he also has a master's degree uh, from Johns Hopkins uh, University. And then uh, he has a, a PhD in zoology from um, uh, the University of Hawaii. And then after that, he went also to Harvard Law School. So a really impressive background. So please join me uh, uh, in welcoming Dr. Brown. Thank you, Pierre. Can you, can you hear me OK? Uh, well, I'm, I'm really sorry to have come today and precipitated the departure of the secretary. <laughs> I'll make you one promise, which is I'll be, uh, I won't talk a whole hour. I, I, uh, I once gave a lecture, and the organizers arranged for uh, notes to be passed out and for people to make comments on what they thought, how good the lecture was or not. And, and I read one of, the, one of them afterwards, and, and, and it said, if I had just one hour left to live, I would like to spend it listening to Dr. Brown. I read that and, man, I just felt really good. And then I read the second sentence, which said, because every minute would seem like an hour. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about today is I, I, I've been interested in preservation of DNA for species for a long time since I worked for Bruce Babbitt and, uh, and have done what I can to help with funding and, and uh, policy. But I, I ended up uh, getting a little grant from the Richard Lounsbury Foundation to uh, 
to do a, a plan to try to just think through this and lay out a, a plan for how to preserve the DNA of, of, uh, of all species. And I, I, don't, I don't claim to be a, a practitioner of uh, genomics in the way that a number of people here are, but, but I thought maybe I could bring some ideas together. So I, one of the first questions, and you're all sitting here looking at my, I, I wrote this part this morning. I honestly, I find every time I look at why save species DNA and think about it, I've, I have a really hard time giving a cogent answer that, and see to a group like this, it sort of seems self-evident, um, but it's not to a lot of the world. So here's some, but it's worth talking about for a moment. And first of all, there are species that we eat, that we make things out of, uh, that provide medicines which, uh, which have done a whole lot for human society, and they certainly include corn and cotton and penicillium. Uh, and there they are. It's not that long a list. But uh, one argument I would make is that we really don't know when things like that are going to come out of the genes of, of other creatures that we haven't uh, that we may not have really researched that much. And even if you, even if you think most of them won't deliver things that are so special like that, uh, I think when you weigh the global future, the cost of preserving the DNA of all known species for that potential uh, gives a significant positive argument. Okay, another argument is that we are really messing up Mother Nature, right? And it's more than just species, it's the way things interact. And it's probably a smart safety net to preserve uh, species DNA. So as we get back in the distant future, 100 years, 1,000 years, whatever, and try to reconstruct uh, out of necessity uh, ecology to some degree, it will be good to have that. The call of the wild, I mean, when you look at how animal planet and Recreation and all of this stuff, there is, I mean, I would argue there's something that's built into our genes and certainly into our culture for a lot of people that makes complexes of species and the richness of biodiversity something that's worth preserving. And then, I, you know, I, I confess, I, you know, it's, it's probably, it dates me, but I, I actually feel a responsibility to protect that there's an ethical uh, duty. I have it at least, I'm sure a lot of you do, that they, to to not extinct species. And I, I put in the responsibility to protect because it's been in the news lately in respect to whether or not we should strike Syria and why we struck Libya. So I'm not suggesting we intervene to save species without Security Council authorization, but, but I think there's something there. And DNA is the blueprint of these species. So quickly, how many are there? About, about 1.9 million have been described. There's one. Uh, 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 PLOS biology review from 2011 that estimates 8.7 million plus or minus 1.3, and that's been cited a lot. And then there, are, there may be many more bacteria and fungi. You know, may, maybe a million and a half more fungi. Who knows how many more bacteria? It depends a lot on how you define species. So the good news about the task of preserving the DNA of all species and all species as we discover them in the future is that it's, it's doable from my perspective. First of all, what has already been described, $1.9 million, it's not that big a number. You're not even that rich if you have it, $1.9 in dollars nowadays. And then, and then we're not talking about uh, preserving the DNA this year of the remaining five-fold or ten-fold because because the description of new species, the preservation of their tissue would be linked to their description, and that's not coming out like a fire hose, right? So we've got, we got what we know, which is manageable, and we have a process for describing new things that's at a manageable rate. So what do you preserve? And I, I've got these five categories, which, which is what it mostly comes down to, living populations, Tissue frozen alive, tissue frozen dead, unfrozen tissue, dried or bottled, and extracted DNA. Living populations, let's call them the gold standard. They're expensive, but if you can, if you can keep animals or plants in a, 
places like these, that's a good thing. Because you not only have their DNA, but you've got everything else. Tissue frozen alive. I mean, the two largest categories probably are, well, seed banks and viable animal cells. Uh, there are many seed banks. There's, there are thousands. There are over a thousand pretty good-sized ones. But, but just to note, of the, of the largest, the Millennium Seed Bank, it was, it was launched about 15 years ago with funds from the British Lottery. It's a nice use of lottery funds. And uh, I think they're up to about 33,000 species of plants now. And their objective is to get up to 75,000 by 2020, which would be roughly 25% of vascular plants. This Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is in Norway, and what it does is it takes seeds that are duplicates from other repositories. And it's pretty big, it has maybe 700,000, 750,000 samples now. Uh, and the samples have multiple seeds and, and uh, a big capacity, over a million samples. And then the, I think the largest facility, one that I've been to in the United States, is in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is agriculture department. And, and uh, mostly has seeds and uh, electrical refrigerators, but some liquid nitrogen, and has capacity for about a million and a half samples. And then for viable animal cells, I've just picked three out here. Uh, there's the San Diego Frozen Zoo, uh, which is the life's work of, of uh, Oliver Ryder. And uh, what he's, he's focused on endangered vertebrate animals. It's largely the kind of thing that comes out of a zoo experience there. And he has about 20,000 samples in liquid nitrogen, about 1,000 species. So, but these are very important species to have the preservation of. And then there are two places that you might want to drop in on if you're interested and find this stuff interesting, the American Type Culture Collection and Fisher Bioservices. The, the ATCC is, is a nonprofit organization, but it's pretty profit-oriented as far as I can tell. It's, and its main operation is in Rockville. Uh, they've got maybe 200 uh, refrigerators of different kinds. They mostly store human cells. That's where the money is. But, they're, but they've got viruses and bacteria and protists, and they keep a fair amount of the Park Service, National Park Service's collection. Fisher Bioservices well, was described by the A. TCC people when I was there, it's in Frederick as a, as a, as a freezer farm, which it really is. It's just a gigantic place that has over 15 million samples. So, so it's got the capacity for three times the largest museum cryo freezing operation that I'm aware of, which is here. Uh, it's all human. But they said we can, you know, if the money's there, we can expand. So they're, they're definitely a backup, if, especially for things that are not being actively worked on. And then I, I, since Pierre is here and was kind enough to introduce me, I, I have to mention there's a lot of egg and sperm at zoos, for example. The third category is to freeze tissue dead. I do feel like I'm going through a zombie movie here a little bit. Uh, the, the, the largest uh, uh, enterprise doing that in, in a museum in the United States now is the new Smithsonian facility with a capacity of for 4.2 million samples. And I think there are 58 electrical freezers and there are 20 liquid nitrogen containers. It's a huge, huge investment in, in a good way. And it's going to have live, it's going to have viable tissue too from the, from the zoo, for example, but it's mostly dead tissue. Where, but the virtue of this is that the DNA, if, if, you know, in a lot of cases, is not so degraded that it will be preserved and can be sequenced. Uh, so the genomes can be determined. And its sequencing, as most, many of you know, is getting cheaper and faster. And so the whole process is uh, allowing this approach to be much more interesting. And then quickly, the American Museum has, has, for example, a capacity for a million samples in liquid nitrogen. It's, got, it's pushing 100,000 samples currently in storage. And then one, one of my former places, the Academy of Natural Science, has uh, the uh, frozen tissue from 4,000 bird species. So it's 40% of the birds, pretty good, pretty good collection. And then I put in the ocean genome legacy because they're adamant about the value of extracting DNA and preserving it. 
it's you know smaller samples, and they say they can replicate it. Uh, so there, there, so this is another category. So the challenges, and, and actually, let me make it clear what the focus of this whole thing is. It is if one wants to go about preserving the DNA of all species, those known and those described, how do you go about doing it? You know, how do you break? Oh, we haven't done it yet, so why? You know, so they're different. They're different challenges. Competing priorities, big and small. I mean, and it's uh, it's sort of trite, but it's clear that that uh, money is hard to get nowadays from government, from donors. They've all got their priorities. You might have a great idea. You go bang on their doors, and a lot of them just say, "I'm sorry. You know, we've uh, you know we, we we love it, but we're funding this other stuff." And that could be within science, and it could be beyond science. And then that's the big side. The small side, you know, there are, in, in this whole area, there's human versus no, non-human. There, if you're studying, uh, if you're studying the taxonomy of a large group, you may not really care to have a huge number of samples of each species. If you're studying uh, malaria caused by Anopheles, you know, you're going to want to have many, many samples of that species. So these are money competition. National sovereignty is an issue. The, the, South America has been, uh, uh, for example, for a long time uh, presented issues there where basically uh, less wealthy countries are afraid people are going to go in and collect their stuff and then come back out and make money and they're going to not make money on it. That's a challenge. The ruggedly individual curators, there's, there are probably still a few of them left at the Smithsonian, and, uh, but I've known a few in my day and, and uh, I love them, but a lot of them, there are some that still exist that don't want to work on anything other than what they're working on. They, they're not about to spend any time on anything else. They're not about to put any money into it. And actually, some of them don't want to even, people don't even know what they're doing because they want to make sure they get that publication out that, the way they want it. They're worried about someone else that might do the same thing. Uh, wild versus laboratory tension, there is a little bit of that in the environmental community. If you put money into preserving uh, uh, ex situ, are you going to? Are people going to say it's fine? You know, we got the DNA of uh, uh, the whooping crane. Why don't we just kind of let it go bye bye in the field? Um, and then I put Ted Williams' head up because I was sure everybody'd be looking at the last line. But by that, what I mean is, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, when I talk to people about this issue, I can tell some of them think it's icky. It's sort of like you know the X Files, and so there's still a little bit of. I think time and education about these kinds of issues to win win over the broader public, but there of course there are answers to all these things. Competing priorities. So what else is new? You make a case. National sovereignty. There, there is a protocol now that was adopted under the otherwise pretty ineffectual Convention on Biological Diversity that allow that provides for prior in, informed consent for the export of specimens from countries. And and actually, you know, if you pursued this. What you'd want is to have, a, you know, for example, probably a national center, maybe a network, but a national, but you know, a, a good focus in each country of preservation, a little Smithsonian everywhere, ideally, and uh, so even if they're not into trading at the moment, uh, you know, if you facilitate storage within a country, that's a good thing. And then also, it occurs to me, I mean, Venezuela and Ecuador could share, even if they don't want to share with the United States. So, th so th there, there are ways to go to develop this without solving sovereignty immediately. I think the ruggedly individual curator is mostly riding over the horizon on his horse, although there are the few who we must, we must love who are still around. Wild versus lab laboratory, I mean, it's kind of a false comparison in a way we need to do both. There's no way we're going to resurrect a lot of species and put many of them back in the field. Uh, it's, we have to, if we care about these things, we have to preserve them there too. But it's, it's silly not to preserve their, their DNA to have the option and the information about them. And I don't know about the icky, icky, icky thing. It's just going to take a while. And then one kind of basic point on money. When I first got into this, I thought, well, you know, for $500 million, <laughs> If you get governments to pony up, pony up, you could launch some master plan and get this thing done. But, but it's not going to happen in this environment. Uh, uh, it's still way under a moon launch, but we need to find some way to, to move this that's short of it. So what, what should we do? Well, I have three basic kinds of thoughts. 
avoid the perils of endless meetings and top-down coordination. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't have some virtues, that you do need to coordinate and meetings can be fun. I've been to a few of them. Uh, but it, it is the, you know, the sort of a disease that hangs over international cooperation, especially in general and firm on a national. Second, establish a wiki framework for action with a few basic rules. Uh, and three, establish incentives to get the job done. So those are general. Now I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm closing in on three recommendations and then I'll be done. My three recommendations are first, a website. Uh, to set up and maintain a website using the catalog of life, I'll try to comment on it in a moment, where registered repositories can keep their own information uh, and where additional general information can be posted. Now on catalog of life, there's no authoritative list of the species on Earth, and I, there may never be. Uh, but, and there was a cacophony of groups uh, 15 years ago or so that started trying to get into this. But two seem to have emerged as leaders. It was Species 2000 and ITIS, and ITIS was the US, Species 2000 was in England. They've sort of, as I understand it, they've combined, and, and uh, at least in their effort to produce a list. And the catalog of life now has about 1.4 million species, their list. So that only leaves 500,000 of what's known now. So my thought is, why not, why not, why not go with it? On this website, so repositories would register. They would post, and from time to time update, the number of samples they hold by species using the catalog of life. And they would categorize samples as live, frozen viable, frozen dead, <laughs> unfrozen dead, or, or extracted DNA. I do like the unfrozen dead. Um, and I'm sure that if the organizers, people that developed the site would add other elements and, and you would want to invite all sorts of other kinds of information, including geo-referenced information and so forth. But I think you could do this and you could, you know, you could give information in these categories and add all the rest of it and this would be a really, a really big start. Uh, and one reason I'm attracted to it is that when I was at the academy, Natural Sciences and the Bishop Museum, we got a million requests for information on our collections and the curators and collection managers mostly would have to fill all this stuff out. And they hated it because they, you know, they would go into a black hole and then somebody would publish a report. And, but I think if you could post your own information and keep it up and people would know it was your information, that, that, you know, and you wouldn't have to redo it all the time, this would be a, a, a welcome thing. And, if, and actually, if the people around Philadelphia or Honolulu wanted to know what you had, you could focus them there. Um, and we don't have something like this now. If you want to post stuff on websites, now you have to submit it to somebody, a secretariat or someone, and they'll work through it, and it takes a while, and you're not sure what's going to come out the other end. Okay, then I would also have the participating institutions say whether they want anything to be contributed by the public. Some may not, but if they did, have them provide guidance for collection and delivery and contact or questions. So, so you know, this, in my mind, this deals with the, the issue that any museum person would think of, which is we don't want a whole bunch of crap put on our doorstep. We don't have any room, there's nobody to manage it, but, but, if, but, but you actually might might get some stuff you wanted that was helpful, and think internationally, not just the United States. If you, you know, if, if curators said, well, if we could lawfully get, you know, certain species of beetles or whatever that we're working on collected in this way, we'd like it and, and uh, do that. And then, of course, the website would provide other additional useful information on collection storage, use and exchange, anything else good to know. Which, and this is the kind of stuff that is, that, that is being discussed internationally at all these meetings and so forth. And step two are incentives to contribute. And the recommendation, uh, my recommendation is to establish grant publication and collecting incentives for contributing tissue. And uh, on the, there are already grant and publication incentives for contributing data because agencies and some journals like Nature require data sharing. 
And if, you're, and if you have a DNA sequence uh, for those institutions, you are required to provide the information to someone. And for, for DNA information, it's largely GenBank nowadays, managed by NIH. So why not just extend it to tissue if people are uh, working on describing new species? You'd have to think about when you trigger that, but for describing new species, it makes a lot of sense. And then collecting incentives for contributing tissue. Uh, when I was at Interior, the uh, Yellowstone National Park was freaked out because, and some of you know this story, because, you know, this uh, uh, Thermus aquaticus, a microorganism in a hot spring, was, uh, was, was in a culture collection, and from it was derived the DNA fingerprinting use a, using uh, an enzyme. And Hoffman LaRouche made a billion dollars. They don't own it anymore, but they made a billion dollars, and the Park Service said, why can't we get some of the money? So, and they developed a, uh, a, an agreement with companies that came in for revenue sharing with approval by the Park Service if there were commercialization. And then Interior, uh, the thing I was involved in was expanding it to all the wildlife refuges and the parks and BLM. So uh, you could do something like that for collecting on public lands. If someone is collecting f with the purpose of describing new species, uh, we wouldn't worry about uh, geological fossils where the DNA is gone. Um, uh, you could be required in your permit to uh, uh, contribute tissue. And, the, and it might be only if you were actually were moving forward for publication or something like that, if you knew you were going to do it. But I could see this working. I think it would prompt contributions. And then th the third thing is fund citizen science to collaborate and, uh, in collecting and contribution. And some of that's already going on. There are all these bio blitz, and mostly it produces stuff that's not useful for museum collections, you know, where you, people go off in the field, volunteers, and collect. However, that does, that does provide an important public uh, engagement and public support for this enterprise, which I think is still looked at as wonky curators and museums, and not that many people outside of museums really would have ever thought about preserving DNA of all species, and I think it would help. But also, if you, if, 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 a, if, if the website I described existed and a grant were made to uh, the Smithsonian, to say the National Museum of Natural History, and the National Museum had specified some things that it wanted, uh, and, it, uh, and it knew the National Wildlife Federation had a citizen science program, it wouldn't be hard to see some collaboration, you know, especially if there was some funding into it that, uh, to get certain things that actually could be useful. And I got to tell you, there's, there's no better ambassador than some of these kids, like you're work, like somebody's working with now around Washington, uh, kids with l less wealth, uh, than to have them really know what's going on. You know, it's good to have them get out in the, country, in the field, but if they actually really knew it, then that would be even doubly cool. So, a final cartoon. Since I use Noah's Ark on the label, I mean, one thing, one thing we need to do is build the Ark, but of course the other thing we need to do is actually get the Ark launched and everything on it. And if we, don't, if we don't get started soon, things other than dinosaurs obviously are sort of dropping off. So, uh, And that's my speech, so I would welcome any, any uh, questions. And I demand at least one. <laughs> we, and we have microphones. Don't be shy. There we go. Uh, what do you see as the role of this uh, type of endeavor in, say, high school or even middle school classrooms and how educators and teachers can involve their students outside of, it, let's say, there isn't a yeah, I, I think schools are uh, just a supernatural, not supernatural, a natural and super thing. Um, and uh, they, would, they, would, they would need some funding, some of them, but not always, you know, to, to get organized. But, but if you had, 
The Academy of Natural Science has a program it's had for 30 years called Women in Natural Science, and it works with high school girls in Philadelphia. And that program alone, it could, you know, could uh, uh, they go into the schools, and you could organize the kids and give them kits for collecting. And so I think I think this, I think schools are real important. When I say citizen science, I, I don't just mean nonprofits. I, I'm really referring to sort of volunteer engagement, uh, civic engagement. Oh, this, by the way, this is being webcast, so I'm, I was supposed to repeat that question. I didn't, but it might, if you don't mind, it might be good to come to the mic, right? That's my instruction. If you're, also, people will stay awake after lunch. If you're using this collaborative process to collect the samples, how do you see the decisions on how to use them being made, or, or once they're in the freezer, they don't? Yeah, you know, somebody else asked me that question earlier today. Uh, it's a good question. I would not, I would not make their use a precondition for the uh, population of this website I'm talking about. It seems to me those issues are going to be uh, uh, vary from institution to institution. They'll be somewhat, you know, there'll be discussion, controversy, and so forth. Um, so. So I wouldn't make it a precondition of launching this thing. But on the other hand, things like the national sovereignty issue, uh, on a, from a global point of view, I, we, we do need to try to ease the, those tensions that, that inhibit uh, exchange and use to the extent that it's consistent with conservation of the material. And, and, I, could, and, I, and I, would, I would encourage not just this website. I mean, this, the global biodiversity uh, genome biodiversity network is already doing a lot of this stuff. We're actually talking about some ways to bring it together. But I mean, part of the task of, of, of this exercise at the international level is to make sure that use is promoted to the extent that it doesn't undermine conservation. There are real issues, though. Like one, one, one example I mentioned in the, uh, the paper I wrote that under wrote this, you might remember, is the Academy of Natural Science has the hair of t the first 12 presidents of the United States. It has a book of hair. Actually, there's several couple volumes of hair, and most of the hair is not human. We call it pile. But it, they've got the first 12 presidents snipped during life, or in some cases, after life. And uh, a lot of people want that hair. Uh, some people are probably trying to figure out if George Washington really did have children. And of course, it's not doesn't include the cuticles, so it's just got mito, it's it's short on uh, DNA other than mitochondrial DNA. But I gather that there's a little bit of <laughs> of other DNA people are making use of now in hair. But it takes a fair amount of hair, so there are all these issues about you know how many strands of hair does it take? And so the academy, with my blessing for now, well, of course I'm gone from it, but I wouldn't let anybody take any of the hair while I was there because I thought maybe technology would get better. And, and uh, so there are issues like that. But I, I, did I answer your question? I wouldn't stop people, though, from putting their data on this website and having citizen science for collection. This collection we're talking about should be sustainable. It should not, shouldn't harm the conservation of any of these species involved. So, uh, and these museums are not going to go wild and just, you know, do crazy stuff, I think. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that as inhibitory. Yes. John. So uh, this is a pricey of a paper that you, that you published and posted on the Brookings Institution website. And I'm wondering if you could describe what the responses have been. Um, because you know it's a it's a high profile place to publish, and uh, particularly if there's a coalition of the willing emerging, that maybe this audience wouldn't see as like we're an obvious partner. But You're an what? easy sell. Yeah. I, the response has been a lot of people have uh, said they liked it. No one has said they didn't like it. Um, I did an op-ed that the Wall Street Journal published summarizing it, and there was quite a bit of commentary on the op-ed and. It was positive, although the first, the first person that commented said, uh, you may bring back their bodies, but you can't bring back their spirits. <laughs> 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 
Because I, I because I did note in the paper that I mean one thing you can do. I'm not I'm not pushing the the restoration of the passenger pigeon last summer, but but you could in principle, uh, you know, resurrect uh, th these creatures, and I think that's an important option. Um, so. Uh, I spread the I'd spread the paper around to several foundations, and I got nothing but positive responses. But I haven't gotten any money yet, and we're talking about that. Uh, but it's but it's only because that you do have to. Uh, a lot of donors are already pretty set in what they want to fund, and it's a you have to find ones that aren't that set. Any response from the diplomatic hearing? No, not that I can recall. Some people wanted to push it at the Rio Plus 20 summit. Um, if, I don't know if it was or not. I didn't go. But, if, but nothing came out of that summit anyway. I think, but, but John, I, I think if we worked on it, we could probably get that community uh, interested. Sort of as a segue to that, um, you know, what you're really talking about is, is what's going to be our long-term legacy, um, documenting diversity that's here today, which will be probably quite different from what's here 200 years from now. But from your perch and from the, in the government, private um, academies, et cetera, really where, is, where do you see finding the long-term solutions for that, um, in, in, including infrastructure, the collecting of the samples, the curating of them? Um, those resources. How how do we get from this concept to to something that really will, you know, be there 200 years from now, and we know how to take a hair sample and 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 go and recreate a wig? Well, I don't I don't pretend to have all the answers. I actually think if we relatively energetically did this, we'd have we'd increase our odds of getting there a fair amount. But I think more most fundamentally, it's a cultural, educational, cultural challenge for the world. And, and uh, I, 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 I don't know if anyone's done a poll on how many people in America have any idea how bi what biodiversity means. I'm not sure I do, really, when I look at the definitions. But I, but I, th I think we tend to kid ourselves on, on how invested in conservation, you know, the natural world and living organisms 